How are you, sir? Hey there, I'm doing well, man. How about yourself? I'm fine too. <laughs> so you're Excellent. in uh, you're in Germany right now. Yes, sir. We are in uh, Stuttgart. Nice. And uh, how's the tour with Testament going so far? Oh, it's been great. Yeah, it's been awesome, man. A bunch of sellouts, a lot of people. It's been a great package, great tour. All the bands are real good pals, so we're all getting along, and everything's been absolutely wonderful. Let's start with your uh, collaboration with uh, Chuck Schuldner of Death. Uh, when did you meet him for the first time? Um, well, actually, Chuck and I were pen pals before we ever, you know, we were part of the metal tape trading scene, and You know, we were just just pen pals and stuff, and I I physically met him in October of 1988 when we did the uh, the Ultimate Revenge 2 video live concert thingy. It was uh, Raven, Dark Angel, Death, Forbidden, and Faith or Fear, and it was filmed in Philadelphia. And that's when when Chuck and I like physically met, but we had written a few letters back and forth before that. You know, back around like 85 or so. And uh, was he a fan of Dark Angel at the time? Or? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah, totally. And uh, what was his uh, favorite Dark Angel record? Uh, I, would, I would imagine Darkness Descends, you know, that was pretty much everybody's favorite record at <laughs> that time, so... Yeah, and uh, how did you get into death? I mean, uh, how did that happen? Well, if, if you're familiar with the name Borovoy Kurgan, yeah, the man who the runs... Manager. The manager of death. Uh, it, it, earlier than at this point that I am speaking about, but uh, Borovoy had put me in, in. He had he had called. Actually, what had happened? I had just broken. Uh, well, I just left Dark Angel, uh-huh. and um, and I was in contact with Borovoy because I was trying to find a vocalist for my 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 new project at the time. And he called me up just kind of out of the blue and said, hey, man, I was just speaking with Chuck. And, you know, would you would you be interested in talking to him about, you know, playing, playing, playing on his next record? He just lost his drummer. So Borovoy put us both in touch. And I, I, I admit that Dark Angel and Death, when we had toured together back in 89, this was in 1992 when all this was going down. But in 89... We kind of left the tour uh, on, on not the best of terms and, um, you know, Death and Dark Angel. We weren't quite uh-huh. seeing eye to eye on stuff. And so um, when, when I spoke with Chuck, it was pretty much just like we just picked up our last civil conversation. You know, last time we were, we were you know, we, we just we had spoken on the phone and, and we... We just, it was, you know, water under the bridge sort of thing. Neither of us brought up about, hey, man, that stuff back in 89 a couple years ago. But what was up with that? We didn't talk about that. We just, we, like I said, we just kind of picked up our last civil conversation, talking about metal, talking about music, talking about just stuff. And, and you know, it seemed like a like it would be a pretty interesting idea. Like, hey, why don't I go out to Florida and let's try to do this record? And, and so that's, that's how that kind of came about. Yeah, and uh, what was your reaction when you heard the uh, human for the first time? I remember being at a a house party, um, and the album had just come out, and somebody had 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 brought it down to the party and said, "Hey, man, let's let's check out this new Death record." And I remember listening to the whole album, being pretty blown away by it. The drums were incredible on it, and the album was really. Um, And I remember turning, I, I, there's somebody sitting, you know, on the other side of the couch. I was sitting on a couch checking it out. And there was a guy sitting on the other end of the couch. And I, and I remember telling him, like, I just looked at him and I said, man, I'm glad I'll never play for this band. <laughs> and, you know, a year later, there I was doing it. But Human was killer, man. That was, that was a great record, man. That's, that's, yeah. that's my personal favorite from Death, totally. And, you know, the problem with that record is that uh, bass lines of Steve DiGiorgio were buried in the mix. I mean... Uh, oh yeah. Uh, that's what makes that album so technical, I think, and it's yeah, pretty man, sad. Uh, and uh, how hard was it to for you to step into the shoes of uh, Sean Reiner? Because, uh, bit... I mean, he was pretty awesome at the time. Yeah, and then you know, I I was too. So uh, 
you know, it wasn't it wasn't that challenging. You know, I'm a, I'm a pretty good mimic. So, um, when when it came to like playing Sean stuff, I like Sean. The Human album is my favorite album to play live as well. You know, and I I try to do Sean's parts. You know, as as close to Sean as as I can make them out to be. And um, yeah, but he, he had great double bass and great hands so it was it was fun you know because i was totally into jazz fusion at the time too so it's like really we get to do this kind of style instead of just going you know jagger you know so cool let's do it you know and chuck was always real real cool about the drum parts i would write he would just always tell me hey man go sick go nuts man play play whatever you want yeah everything you're playing i can play my riffs over the top of it so no problem so just keep doing what you're doing and it, it sounds good to me so that was pretty cool yeah and it's cool because i on almost every band at the time in Tampa, florida was into jazz fusion like cynic or atheist death you know and uh, yeah man do you consider uh, these albums uh, like human or individual as uh, jazzy or not um, not, not super jazzy, I suppose, but, but definitely trying to, uh, expand the boundaries of what, for instance, drumming was in metal at the time. I, I think all the albums tried to expand on, on the templates that had been laid down by others, just trying to expand upon it. So, so that, that, that was pretty good. Yeah, and uh, do you think that you guys raised the bar on individual or I mean, um, compared with human? Well, that's a good question because, like, for me, individual was so different sounding than than human. Um, and I, I, I do remember when, when Chuck and I were speaking at first, and he was telling me, I have this little riff tape together that, you know, I'll, I'll send you. You'll get it in a few days. Um uh, you know, and I'm thinking, wow, you know, Chuck, myself, we are going to create this just massive monster of a death metal triumphant record. It's going to be so fucking death metal. It's going to be awesome. And little did I know at the time that Chuck, you know, Chuck's tastes and his writing tastes were starting to veer away from the just pure savagery of death metal into something a little more musical, a little more tasty, a little more catchy. So I was a little bit surprised when I heard that riff tape that that you know when when I finally got it in the mail, I was I was a little surprised like wow okay this this isn't as just savagely brutal as I was expecting, but it was still really catchy and really tasty and a lot of good stuff to work with. So by the time you know, a few weeks later, you know, I just listened to that tape quite a bit, wrote my own drum parts in my head. And, you know, finally in December at some point, Chuck and I got together and, and finally and, and started started working on the record. And, we, you know, we put it all together in about three weeks. That's and awesome. I do... I do remember at that at that time thinking, man, we just wrote this album in three weeks. Holy moly, we took three <laughs> weeks to get this thing together. That's so fast. And nowadays, you know, God, Jesus, that, I I think that that I that concept is adorable. You know, just, and uh, I have to ask you, uh, did he interfere in your creative uh, process, or he just told you, man, let it loose? Yeah, yeah, totally. That's that's the way he was. You know, he's he, he he did not interfere what one iota. You know, any sort of drum beat I wrote, he's like, I'm I'm cool with that. I'm good. And like I remember on individual, there was only one drum beat that was changed in the studio, and that was like the 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 opening riff of uh, I think it's uh, jealousy. I think Man, would be the that's song. The best. Yeah, that's the best. Okay, that one. <laughs> yeah, awesome. and and I, I had a drum beat that Scott Burns, the the producer, told me. Man, I'm 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 not feeling that beat right at the at the start of the song, and then when you return to it later, can you come up with something different, like right here and now? And so I did, and that was that was the only change that we made from. Our little demos that we were making in those in those three weeks prior, 
that was about the only only beat that I changed. And I remember Symbolic had the same thing, only one beat where uh, Jim Morris was like, hey, man, can, can we do something different there? So, yeah, awesome. not, not too bad. Yeah, man. Yeah. And uh, the drum sound on the individual is like a more uh, has more of a live sound than when compared with human. I think was that intentional or? Oh boy, I couldn't even tell you. It was a completely different drum set. I know, and I, I admit I wasn't the happiest with the drum sound on it. Um, but you know, that's 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 the best that Scott Burns could do at the time, and. Um, you know, Scott. Scott was really cool to work with, and um, but I, I was used to getting like, I, I I was used to attempting to get really big drum sounds, and really about the only band I had done serious recording with was Dark Angel before that, but we yeah. were always trying to get really big drum sounds, and I I remember Individual did not have the it had kind of a, a very mid-range drum sound, more more attack than boom. And you know, I remember when I first heard the final mix, I wasn't a part of any of the mixing or anything, nor was I expected to be. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> but, um, you know, when I first heard it, I was like, ooh, boy, I don't know about this. But... You know, hey, it is what it is, and and you know, it didn't seem to detract from, from the, from from the album's interest from people or anything. So, so there you go. But if you yeah. noticed on Symbolic, we went with a brand new producer, and we tried to get a pretty, was a pretty decent sound. Or? Yes, it was. And what was the difference uh, working with uh, Scott Burns and uh, Jim Mark? Who was like the better producer? In well, your um, opinion. well, I I I think Jim was probably he was used to working with like say larger budgets and and you know he had his approach and Scott had his approach, um, and you know Scott comes from a more metal kind of you know he was doing a whole lot of metal bands at the time, yeah. you know he was like the go-to guy for for quite some time there. And, She's like what sucks know, for. I mean, for death metal as a producer, he was yeah, like there you go. father for all the bands. <laughs> yeah, yeah, kind of, in a big way, totally. But yeah, he just, you know, Scott Scott was killer, and, and Jim was also killer, and, and, you know, I think Jim had a little more, um, I, I, no, I don't want to use the word polished, but, you know, he had just kind of a more streamlined approach, I suppose. And, and you know, both sound, both bands, both albums sound, you know, quite different from each other. And, and both are great on their own merits, I suppose. So so it's a win-win with both records, really. Yeah, right. And uh, how strong was the lineup for uh, individual, in your opinion? Um, well, that was, that was a killer lineup on on the album, totally. I mean, like Stevie D, he's the best metal bassist in the world. You know, that's yeah. his, Stevie D is my favorite metal bassist. You know, he's one of my, my favorite bassists. Period. Yeah, totally. And you know, ironically, I I never met Andy LaRock until I don't know 2013. Really? You never? Yeah. In the never met him. No, man. This was <laughs> this was just it was. Uh, Chuck and myself and um, Stevie D had come out like about a week before we went in to record and Stevie D was there for the drum recording but they decided to hey let's let let's send you know let's while we do the rhythm guitars and the lead guitars we'll send Steve back home with the with the tracks let him get to know him a little bit because steve was kind of brought in rather late to that session um and uh and so steve went home with the with with the drums and got to write you know bass lines to the drums to the guitars and stuff so um, that's that's how that came about i suppose but uh the lineup was amazing you know was, everybody did a great job andy larock's leads are incredible and then yeah chuck chuck wrote some really cool memorable songs and 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 you know it was it was super awesome so I, i'm the, super stoked with it 
And what is like your favorite uh, song from that album? Do you have any favorites? From individual? Yes. Gosh, I, probably Overactive Imagination. You know, I like that song a lot. But I happen to like all the songs on there. Like, there are a lot of albums that I've been on that I'm like, mm, I don't like every song on this record. But I, I happen to enjoy the entire ind individual record. You know, I think it's, it's got a bunch of really cool songs on it and a bunch of really cool parts and. You know, really cool, cool playing. So, you know, I, I, I like it. Yeah, and it's good to note that there is a, a cover of Possessed Exorcist on the album. Yeah, so, man. That, uh, whose idea was that? That was mine, and that's actually me <laughs> on that's that's me on guitar on that one. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I, I played the, the guitar on that because. I remember, uh, you know, we were talking about doing some covers, and and I brought up the possessed exorcist thing. And Chuck's like, "Yeah, cool. I don't know the riffs. I don't know the riffs though." And I was like, "Well, tell you what, let me track the drums. I'll just, I, you know, I know the song backwards and forwards, so I'll track the drums to myself. Just, you know, no, no guitars or anything, and then I'll lay down a a guide guitar vo guitar line for you. You know, I'll I'll, I'll play the guitars on it." And um, and then you can learn it, and then you put your guitars down on it. And I guess he just was never able to get around to it, so it just sat in the vault forever until they did the re-releases back in what 2011, I think that was. Yeah. yeah. And um, mm -hmm. and then they you know they pulled that one out of the vault. You know they they went through all the old tapes and found the fact that hey man here's here's an entire song. It's got no vocals on it or probably bass either, but. Let's put that on as a little extra, a little bonus track. So that's pretty fun. Yeah, but uh, why why was that song instrumental? Did you just didn't have time to finish it completely, or what? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's that's there's uh -huh. I, I am I am the only person playing on that entire song. The guitars, <laughs> the drums. That's all me. So, um, so yeah, that's what I'm saying. Chuck just I just don't think he had the time to to revisit it. You know, he was. Working on the rest, you know, he's probably writing lyrics and vocals as as he went, I would imagine, and uh, that probably took up the majority of of the time that we had to record. So, um, so yeah, he just never got around to putting his guitars on it or, yeah. or vocals. So, but there you go, it's a karaoke version of <laughs> of Exorcist. Do your own yeah. vocals. And uh, was he friends with Jeff Becerra of Possessed? I mean, Chuck. I, I, I think so. You know, I, I know he he always cited Jeff as an influence, and you definitely hear hear the similarities, like on Scream Bloody Gore. You know, you could tell he was definitely into into Becerra totally. So um, that was the fun thing about Jeff Becerra is that was a speaking voice. You know, that's just the way he sounded. You know, back yeah. back in those days. You know, that's just that was just his voice, and you know, that, he wasn't doing some. You know, fake death metal gruff voice. No, that's just the way the guy talked. So, so that, was, that was pretty cool. Yeah, man. And uh, then in 1993, you guys started to tour uh, on individual fuck patterns. And uh, I think European tour was canceled for some reason. What happened? Um, no, we never canceled the tour. Uh, the Maybe some earlier stuff was canceled, but we came out and we did the Full of Hate festivals. And mm -hmm. that that and as a matter of fact, we played this club that we're playing tonight. You know, the the poster is still on the wall from, from that tour. But uh, yeah, we did the Full of Hate festivals, and then we did a U.S. run, and then we did a proper European run. I remember that. So uh -huh. I made a mistake then. <laughs> No, ah, no worries. Yeah. And no uh, what was it like to play these songs live? Uh, it was a lot of fun, you know. Just get get to know. It was fun to play all the songs. I, I I enjoyed playing the tunes and and some of the old like the older tunes, like the ones off Leprosy. I thought we we did a pretty good like updating of them because Chuck on those songs he, he wasn't like no you have to play it just like it is on the record Chuck was like do, do, do your own thing to it make it yours it's okay it's, it's cool man let's you know you, you have to play the parts so you make the parts fun for you you know because I know you can I know you can do some some really cool stuff 
to songs from leprosy and and scream bloody gore so so go nuts and so yeah it, it, it was a lot of fun playing all of it and like i said i really enjoyed playing all the human era stuff you know we were doing like flattening of emotions and suicide machine and and uh lack of comprehension and you know stuff like that and that's all those songs were really really fun to play so and uh, it, was, it, it was a good set who was the guitarist in that tour? Was it Ralph Santola or? Uh, it was, yeah. And uh, was he, uh, I mean, uh, good enough for death at the time? Uh, he was a, he was a killer player, and Ralph, you know, Ralph has become this you know kind of a death metal you know journeyman you know like he's he's been around quite a lot of death metal bands but yeah. at that at that time ralph was not death metal in any way shape or form he was he was he was a, a, a local a local player from orlando and that's where death was based out of and um, yeah he was he was like you know a friend of chuck's but he was his band was was definitely more more hard rock and you know kind of more radio rock kind of stuff but we needed a guitarist and and we were actually looking around orlando for bobby coble um yeah. I, i remember that that's why we got andy to play on the record because chuck was like i'm trying to get the number for this local guy named bobby coble he's a killer player I want him for individual, but I can't find him. And this is you know, before the this is before the internet and all that stuff, obviously. So, if you know, if if you didn't know how to get a hold of somebody, that it was a challenge to get a hold of them. You just couldn't go online and find their, you know, their 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 Facebook profile or anything. So, uh, yeah, but, um, yeah. So yeah, he, he he couldn't find him. So we got we got Andy LaRock, and and that worked out great. But. Uh, I wish we had Bobby during all that era. Yeah, that would have just been beautiful just because I love Bobby as a <laughs> as a person, as a yeah. player, you know. But but Ralph did great. You know, he did he did a good job and he was able to take our uh, our our ribbing, you know, me and Steve would would tease him a lot about, you know, just being a hard rock guy and stuff <laughs> like that. So I mean, it's pretty funny to know that he was a potential guitar player for individual. I didn't know that. Yeah, and, uh, Bobby, man, that would have been great. And uh, why did Steve leave the band? Was it because of the kids at the time, or? What? Yeah, yeah. He he told Chuck, "Look, I'm I'm gonna, I, you know, I'm, I'm." Actually, he didn't end up being exited from the band until we were in the symbolic uh, writing phase, and, um, you know, when they were when Chuck and Steve were discussing. Uh, schedules and stuff like that Chuck was like okay the album's going to be coming out around this date and the touring is going to start around this date and Steve had mentioned uh, my wife is going to be having our first child at that time and <clears throat> Chuck was like well gosh I, uh, I I need somebody on the album who's also going to be able to do the tours and so that's why we went with Kelly uh, Kelly, Kelly Conlon, Conlon. Yeah. and um, you know, and and that actually didn't didn't last for very long, um, and I'm not really sure why Steve wasn't recontacted, you know, but uh, yeah, so there you go. Yeah, and uh, it's kind of sad to know that both Satis and the Dark Angel were kind of dead because of the lack of commitment to these bands. Uh, do you feel in that way, or I mean, if you weren't, you know, in Death and so many other bands, maybe Death, uh, Dark Angel would be bigger, you know? Oh no, we uh, we I had already, you know, Dark Angel had kind of just kind of run itself into the ground. Um, uh -huh. Our in in September of '92, uh, my singer Ron Reinhardt left the band and. <laughs> It was kind of, it was, I suppose, up to myself to carry on, take another few months, find another singer. Um, and I just didn't have the energy to do that. So I also told Dark Angel, hey, guys, you know, I'm, I think I'm going to 
I'm going to take a walk too. And I started putting a new project together, but that was the time I got the call from Borovoy. And then the death thing just kind of took off. So, um, yeah, so I, it, Dark Angel was already moribund by the time uh, by the time I was working with death. So. Uh -huh. And uh, you know, on the Time Doesn't Heal uh, album, there was a sticker which said like 246 riffs. I mean, who so, counted these riffs? I did. <laughs> I, I did. I, and uh, I merely counted them because I, I wanted to give the proper credit to whoever wrote the majority of riffs in the song because that was in in uh, on time does not heal it was myself and brett erickson doing all the writing our, our our new guitarist and i just i just happened to count up the riffs just so i could put you know erickson hoagland or <laughs> hoagland erickson on the on the music part and i just happened to, to like somebody from the record label had had I was talking to somebody on the phone and they're like, Jesus, man, there's a whole shit ton of riffs on this thing. And I'm like, <laughs> well, actually there's 246 of them. <laughs> and, and they're like, wait, 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 what? You, you counted these? And I explained, yeah, this is why I counted them. And, and then all of a sudden, a few months later, God, it comes out on a poster, you know, Definitely. nine songs, 246 riffs, 67 minutes or something like that. Yeah. And it, it was really just a, a humorous conversation I had had with somebody at the record label. So. And uh, was, what's the name of the guitarist? Uh, is it Eric Mayer or the Dark Angel um, guitarist? Yeah, well, Eric Meyer was one of the guitarists, but... Um, Brett Erickson was our newest guitarist. He replaced Jim Durkin, and uh -huh. Brett, Brett, and I were the were the writers of the record. And uh, there's like a lot of uh, Eastern sounding riffs on that album, like psych uh, psychosexuality. I mean, it's mystical riff, you know. Yeah, sure. Just slow down, and uh, uh, who who brought these influences? Uh, that was that was me uh, on that song. Um, I I. I if, if you listen carefully, I stole the song Miserloo from yeah, yeah. Dick Dale. I mean, that's not even his song. <laughs> you know, a, kind, yeah, it was, it, was, it was definitely influenced by Miserloo, and that was like three, four years before Pulp Fiction ever came out. So, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just liked the melody. So I, I, I robbed it. But, uh, <laughs> um, but Brett also had, you know, he had his sort of little, in the leads. You know, I, I really enjoyed Brett's leads. I thought Brett had great leads on Time Does Not Heal, and his riffs were killer and, and stuff. But I'm a, I was a big Middle Eastern, you know, flavor sounding guy. So any sort of Middle Eastern influences, that, that, would, that would be me probably. Yeah, and uh, I have to ask you, why did you guys uh, name the album Darkness Descends? I mean, uh, it's pretty apocalyptic, you know. And it yeah, came man. Out, it came out in 1986 when Chernobyl happened. So, is there any connection between these two things? Or? Oh, not, none whatsoever. It was just a couple of cool words that Jim Durkin came up with. Like Darkness uh -huh. Descends. It's like, wow, that sounds cool. Yeah, man, cool. <laughs> and uh, there is, uh, I think the song was called Black Prophecies or something That's like right. that. That's right. Which is like yeah. about nuclear annihilation and, uh, and that was how, that how, that was actually about a lot of nostradamus's predictions that's what uh -huh. that song was about and uh, you know he would he predicted the you know nuclear annihilation and <laughs> the, the great london fire and the fact hitler was gonna come around and so i just kind of made the song a a a small categorical list of some of his his predictions so that's what black prophecies was about and yeah did you think uh, do you think that this cold war paranoia uh, i mean created thrash metal as a genre um i don't think it did but i definitely think it helped in a lot of bands um lyrical approaches you know bands like nuclear assault or yeah. You know, anybody that was talking about the bomb, you know, because that, that was a huge thing for all of us. And, and But I, I, I really tried to take Dark Angel's lyrics in a more personal air area, you know, like, like I mean, I was 17 when we were writing Darkness Descends, and I, I wrote the majority of lyrics for, for it. So I was a young man with a vocabulary, 
Like for instance, <laughs> dark, darkness descends itself is about uh, an issue of Judge Dredd comic book. You know, That's all. Awesome. Judge Dredd issue number four, um, which featured these four creatures called the four dark judges, or the, the dark judges, and yeah, you know, four dark judges, and um, you know that was it was just I just always thought it was funny how heavy metal was always considered to have comic book lyrics, so I decided to write lyrics about a comic book. You know, That's awesome. I was just trying to be me, trying to be clever, but <laughs> you know, there you go. And uh, when you compare, let's say, Bay Area thrash metal fans to Tampa, Florida death metal fans, who is more aggressive? You know. Oh God, the Bay Area by by far. <laughs> yeah, back and, back in eighty four, eighty five, eighty six, Bay Area just was psychotic, and L A too. Like L A had the psychotic fans too. You know. So. <laughs> <clears throat> and why were people so aggressive? I mean. Was it because of drugs and music combined, or what? <laughs> Absolutely, I, I think in the Bay Area, yeah, a lot of drugs, and down in LA, it was just the music and just the the whole vibe of living living in LA, which is a pretty you know pretty tough town. Like the 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 Hollywood version of Los Angeles is you know Beverly Hills and rock stars partying on the Sunset Strip, but the reality of LA is it's a fucking tough place, you know. You, you get a lot of fights and a whole lot of drive-bys, drive-by shootings and whatnot. And so I think that that's what brought a lot of the aggression out in L.A. Like we had a lot of gangs involved in 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 the thrash metal scene down there. Like the Suicidals, the the L.A. Death Squad, the Lads, the the Eat, the West Side Longos. You know, a lot of gang members would be involved in coming to the shows and stuff. And, and uh -huh. You know, it, there was it was very common. We do, you know, we do shows down at Fenders in Long Beach, in a really tough part of Long Beach, and you know, there'd be people get knifed and just shit kicked and whatnot. And then they started doing shows at the Balboa Theater, which was in South Central Los Angeles. You know, just the wrong place for white, long-haired people. And we had a lot, we had mostly a Mexican scene in, in L.A., but, you know, going into South Central to go see shows, that was, that was brutal, but people would do it, you know, and you'd get your car robbed, or you'd get jacked on the way, you know, way to your car after the show, and you know, it, it was a rough neighborhood, so we just had a lot of violence in the L.A. scene just to begin with, and, you know, because L.A. had a big punk scene, too, and, and the punks would come out to all the thrash metal shows because it's fast and aggressive, but, you know, it, it was like fire and water, you know, with, with the crowd for a while until they started coming to whatever understandings they needed to come to to, to be able to... Yeah, to merge at at shows and you know not not shed as much blood, but yeah, totally. And uh, those scenes were violent. Uh, was Suicidal the only band with the gang, or I mean, from the thrash metal scene? Yeah, uh, because Suicidal was a gang before they were a band. So, <laughs> um, yeah, they they I think so. You know, I don't think anybody else like, ooh, we've we've got a gang. But you know, you you would just see the suicidals at, at all the shows and you know, they all looked like the band and you know, they were around before the band. So yeah, yeah just a bunch awesome. of tough guys that would just beat up on young metal dudes, but you know, the metal dudes would fight back. So And uh, how real was this death to posers thing? Well, we we all love the Exodus you know, whole whole shebang of that, but yes, it was real. It, it, it was very real, especially with like Dark Angels crew, our <laughs> our, ro our road crew. Like, you know, they they really took the whole Exodus thing to to heart. You know, like, <laughs> I you know my my drum tech, the Satanic Hispanic. I mean, he got taken to jail for for lighting a poser's hair on fire oh at a club. God. You know, jump jumped on his back and let you know set his hair on fire and. and <laughs> And of getting taken to jail for that, and our crew, if they did, if they were at your show and they did not like your band, they would beat you up off the stage. Like they would, they would go on stage and kick your ass. You know, it was like fuck. You know, so yeah, it, 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 it was real. You know, totally. 
Awesome. And uh, what is like your favorite memory of Paul Bailo? Oh God, Jesus! Just, uh, just being like when, when I was 16, I went on tour with Slayer, and I was their lighting guy. And this was before Dark Angel. This was before Death, obviously. And um, I remember we just, you know, we we went up to the Bay Area. We we did a West Coast tour, and you know, one of the shows was at. at in the Bay Area, and it was Exodus, Slayer, Possessed, and a band from LA called Vermin. And was that for six bucks or something like that? <laughs> yeah, probably. I mean, probably. I, I think I saw that poster on the internet. Yeah, no doubt. I think it was June twenty third, nineteen eighty four. I think was was the date of that. So yeah, it was probably like a six dollar show. They were never too expensive back then. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, just just seeing Bailoff just being like. The, just bail off, you know, and I remember we, we hung out the night before the show cranking Jack Panzer because Jack Panzer had their first record out only at the time. And it was a little EP. And I remember bail off being a big fan of that. And, you know, I, I remember after the show, a lot of people went to go party at like at somebody's house. And I remember the next morning the party was still going on like and i remember tom from slayer got a call from the 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 lady whose house the party was being held at she got a call from tom said oh my god exodus are destroying my house they're kicking the shit out of my house so did you get down here and try to calm everybody down and so tom and i jumped in the car drove down there and by the time we got there Exodus had bailed, but the house was just in shambles. <laughs> awesome. So I, mean, awesome. I, I, awesome I thought that was pretty cool. I mean, fuck yeah. And uh, were these bands talk it. Were these bands imitating bands like Motorhead or Led Zeppelin when they start bashing hotel rooms or it came out naturally? <laughs> I think it was more natural than anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. They had that so, destructive bent inside them, period. So which I thought was cool, you know. I loved Exodus for that, you know. Fuck, they're gonna <laughs> tie up a poser to a chair and stick knives in him. It's like, fuck yeah, let's do that. You know? Man, I need time machine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, thrash metal is more like a product of culture of violence, I think. <laughs> I, I, I think so, absolutely. Yeah, definitely more than it's it's yeah cultural violence as opposed to the threat of nuclear war. I mean, yeah, it was it was more like, hey, we can go be violent at at shows and and get away with it, and we can go be violent at parties and you know like and, get away uh, with it. So. Yeah. <laughs> and do you think that if it wasn't for Ronald Reagan, that there would have been no like hardcore and fresh metal because a lot of bands were protesting against his, his politics at the time. Fair enough. However, you know, the punk scene was going on a few years before Reagan, and the punk scene came along during the Carter administration, or even the, actually the Ford administration. So, <laughs> so um, you know, I think, I think it was a, just a natural evolution of the uh, aggression that was occurring in the n- late 70s just to be expanded upon in the in the early to mid 80s by you know like for instance all the metal that was out it was awesome we loved it we loved Judas Priest we loved Black Sabbath we loved Iron Maiden we love all that but if there's a way to take that even more extreme than cool you know because I'm sure all the fans of Iron Maiden and Judas Priest were probably thinking, man, music will just never get any heavier than this. Like, <laughs> you'll never have a heavier song than Rapid Fire from Priest or something. And, <clears throat> you know, then Motorhead came you. along. With, <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. I mean, you got, you know, you got Motorhead coming along, you know, putting out Ace of Spades and, and you know, the, the No Life Till, uh, No Sleep Till Hammersmith records, you know, like awesome. that aggression. And then, you know, you got your Venoms coming along with their aggression, and you know, you could just see the natural progression of aggression. You know, and you got your Metallicas and your Slayers and your Dark Angels and all that stuff, and you oh. know, it's like let's just write fast, aggressive music and just make it even heavier. You know, 
And uh, I know that I thought, you know, when I'm hearing thrash metal, I'm like, wow, music, this is the heaviest music is ever going to be. It's never going to get any heavier than thrash metal, which wasn't even called thrash metal at the time. It didn't have any title. But then a few years later, along came death metal and grindcore. And that, that kicked it up another notch. So, you know, whatever you think the heaviest thing ever is going to be, there's going to be something that comes along that out heavies it. And, uh, and and that's a good evolution. Yeah, and how violent were the shows? I mean, there were like thrashers, punk kids, uh, suicidal skinheads. They all hated each other. I mean, uh, yeah, how- it was it was it was a bloody mess a lot of the times, and and a lot of times it depended on where you played. Like like I was, like I was saying, Fender's Ballroom in Long Beach that brought out that was kind of a middle ground. Uh, 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 geographically, so it wasn't too far from anywhere. Um, so you'd get all the gangs coming to those shows, and you know, and and finally, you know, a lot of uh, and the 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 metal heads never created a gang, but they kind of became one anyway because it's like, man, we're not we're not gonna we're not gonna take this, you know, it's like. We're getting attacked by gang members on this side, on that side, on the other side. We're going to fight back. You know, we're all tough guys ourselves. So we might not be a gang, but we're not going to take your shit. So the, the, the blood would spill from there, you know. Yeah, blood upon the stage. <laughs> yeah, there you go, totally. And uh, can we now go back to the making of Symbolic and how did that lineup come to, together? I mean... Well, I remember that Chuck was you know andy i don't think was available and chuck was still looking for bobby however he hadn't found bobby yet so he reached out to akira takasa from uh he, he reached out to akira takasawa from loudness and you know is there that was one of chuck's things chuck loved Jap- japanese metal and loudness or the largest Japanese metal band in history and he had reached out to Akira um, and Akira had said okay yeah I'll, I'll, I'll play on this record but Chuck found Bobby so as soon as he found Bobby Bobby was in but um, Chuck I and Steve Steve DiGiorgio got together for a few months I mean we, we worked on that record for six months nine months something like that rehearse rehearsing and you know big blocks of rehearsals in there i'd I'd go out to florida for a month or so at a time i spent a lot of months out in florida doing doing you know writing the record and stuff and as it like after symbolic came out i i could tell like individual thought patterns sounded kind of rushed symbolic sounded like yeah, you guys spent a lot of time rehearsing, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, so it had, it sat a little differently, just the, the feel of, of symbolic as opposed to individual. It just had a different feel like, Hey, these guys worked on this stuff for a long time. And <clears throat> so, um, I remember Steve had broken his finger during wow. the symbolic rehearsals. So he had to kind of, just kind of sit back but I, I know he played on some of the demos and stuff but I think it was the end like I say that's when when we were t- discussing schedules it was like Steve had his second child on the way by the time Ooh. symbolic was coming out I think or no that was his first um, and that's when it was like oh man I I, I can record the record but I don't think I could do some of that touring because my my babies do like right then right when you guys are leaving so yeah. i can't leave my wife you know and so chuck had to find kelly and so kelly ended up recording the record but kelly's version was you know it was it, it, it steve had sat with the material for a long time um kelly came in kind of late and did, he did a great job but um you know the bass just had a different feel like somebody who would come in very late to the to the project and did you know the best that they they could kelly was a killer bassist but stevie d just you know he had the feel going so um 
you know, that's a shame that Steve couldn't have been a part of Symbolic, but, you know, Kelly Kelly did a fine job. He, he, he did good, but, you know, Stevie D's my favorite, and he's one of my best friends, and so... Yeah. And Stevie D was also Chuck's best friend, you know, like, throughout his whole life, you know, like, they... You know, they knew each other since they were teenagers. You know, we're all, we're all the same age, Chuck, Steve, myself. And, uh, you know, they were friends since teenagers, you know, like hanging out together sort of thing. So when Chuck came out to California, you know, he hung out with Steve tons. So they, they, they remained best friends for all of Chuck's life. So, mm -hmm. so there you go. And uh, is it true that uh, Steve was supposed to play on screen Bloody Gore, but that never happened? I mean, yeah, I that's right. Yeah. That's, that's amazing, but I mean, too bad that, that didn't happen, but on the other side, you have Sadus, which is like a, a fresh death, death metal band par excellence, you know? Yeah, absolutely, man. Totally. That's, that's pretty killer. And... Uh, Symbolic when compared with uh, individual, I mean, uh, it's more polished in terms of production. The riffs yeah. are like uh, more easy. To, I mean, it's easy to play rather than some stuff from from the yes. individual. Yes, absolutely. And uh, wh how big of a challenge was that for you to you know? Well, to I match to match. That? Admit, I, I. I well that's why the drums went so crazy on symbolic <laughs> because because yes the riffs were easier and yeah. you know the riffs were pretty simple and and chuck was starting to to evolve back into like traditional metal sounding you know and so i thought well gosh if i just put some traditional metal drums to this this might just sound like some album from the 80s or something so why don't i just ramp up the the overplaying you know because I, i totally overplayed on symbolic and yeah i, I i've always joked that i played lead drums on symbolic <laughs> but but I it mean, was it, it, it yeah well, it, <laughs> yeah man it, and it was from like the simplicity of the riffs and but i thought symbolic had a lot of really tasty riffs too you know like there was yeah. so many tasty things on there so so that's cool and and that's where um uh, you know I, i i was i was definitely huge time influenced by dean castronovo on on symbolic you know i was i was super into dean castanovo's playing so i i i let like individual had a steve gad influence for me steve gad neil peter and symbolic had had definitely dean castanovo as as the prime influence there so and uh were influenced by a lot of these jazz drummers because you know when i listen to let's say uh pitches proof like miles da miles davis I mean, the drummer was like, like he was playing some death in, the, in a death metal band, you know. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Yeah, totally. Well, like my my, I guess my biggest influence at that time was Aldi Miola. Like a lot of the earlier material from Aldi Miola, like the the Casino record and the there's a beat that's all over the casino album and it's called the bembe beat i didn't even know the name of this beat but i all, all i knew is that i stole it a lot for individual thought patterns and somebody explained to me after the individual came out that hey that's that beat is called a bembe beat and i was like oh no shit i didn't even know it had a name but i got it from steve steve gad and he's like yeah that's 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 a latin beat and it's got a name and all that sort of stuff so steve gad big individual and uh a big individual influence and and dean was you know dean from the shrapnel era uh stuff that dean was doing like like the wild dogs reign of terror album that was a shrapnel band um and that was that was a big influence on me and and his playing on marty friedman's uh what was it dragon's kiss album that was a huge influence as well like i i totally stole the chorus from symbolic i stole it from dean castanovo on what's the song called forbidden city the big oh. middle part of forbidden city from 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 marty friedman yeah i just, I just robbed it 
total <laughs> in, in, in total tribute yeah and uh, when it comes to your drums and symbolic I mean I was in a taxi with my friend and uh, he had a USB and we played the misanthrope and the guy was driving so fast I mean I, I oh, that's describe the, the energy I mean uh, with you know that speed cool. and that that music I mean it's fucking great nice awesome that's cool excellent <laughs> and and the funny thing with uh, symbolic is that uh, it has a lot of groove stuff as well you know I mean it's not just like a melodic death metal album but it has uh, some of the groovy riffs right that's cool and uh, what was Chuck's vision for that album I mean what did um, he tried to accomplish with well, I know that he was definitely breaking away from his death metal roots with with that one fully. You know, he was he was definitely into trying to just break away from death metal and <clears throat> like you know, symbolic has become a you know a, a a staple of the death catalog. It's become you know like I know a lot of people come to me and say that's my favorite album. Um, but I remember when it came out, it was vilified by all death metalers, you know, because death metal was getting pretty popular by 1995. You know, you got your morbid angels and your deicides and your obituaries and your <laughs> napalm deaths and your carcasses and all that. And and death was going melodic, you know, that, that's why I it, it, it's interesting, like the, the death um just legacy i suppose is you know I, I i mean chuck never you know he was always uncomfortable with being called the godfather of death metal he was always yeah, trying yeah. to give credit to, to others he was always saying hey man there were there were bands like possessed and, and, venom. and venom and even merciful fate to a degree you know they were they were doing this 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 heavy stuff before us and and slayer and stuff like that but uh um, you know, it, it, a lot of people do consider Death to be the first death metal band. Of course, Chuck would argue that, but that doesn't change the fact that people think Death is a death metal. So, yeah. um, so, okay, if you want to take that argument, Death created death metal. Then, a couple years later, they're a part of the technical death metal. And there were bands like Atheist and Cynic doing it before, but a lot of people hadn't heard those bands, but they did hear Human. So, for a lot of... And Chuck would argue it then as well. Like, we didn't create yeah. this, but most people are like, death created technical death metal, because I didn't hear <laughs> Atheist, I didn't hear Cynic, I, I heard death. So, that's yeah. what I think you know created it and then on symbolic helping create melodic death metal i mean they helped create three totally different genres like that's pretty good you know like most yeah. bands don't create one <laughs> you know, most bands jump on the genre but you know god death created three of them jesus so yeah and that was one thing with symbolic was it was that was a fun album to write you know we just had a good time while, while we wrote it you know i spent a few months in florida with chuck and and you know just rehearsing in his garage and, you know having cookouts and playing with his animals and you know having a good time it was it was it was a very cool period and you know we, we just worked on the on the album for for that whole time and kept putting love into it and you know fixing this part and i would lie in bed you know at, at in the middle of the you know like before going to bed i'd be working out parts in my in my head for the next morning and then okay go try those parts you know and so it just it just evolved it got to evolve and these days we don't get to do albums like that anymore where you know a couple of guys two three guys just jamming for months i don't get to do records like that because i'm so darn busy but you know i would love to take nine months to write rehearse record an album that, that, that'd be awesome these days yeah and uh, do you get royalties for from these albums no I mean, no mm -hmm. so nope. the deal was just record and then tour and that was it right yeah yeah i i, I don't receive anything for for a lot of the records i do you know I, I, 
Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, and that's, you know, being a drummer is so strange because, you know, for instance, I tried to create beat beats that had never been heard before on these albums. Mm-hmm. Um, and but you don't really get a writing credit for that, you know, like like zero tolerance, for instance. I mean, that's got a lot of beats that, you know, that's the only beat. That's the only time that beat's ever been played is in that song, you know, some of those yeah. things. But but you don't get credit for it, I tell you. Too bad. Yeah, and, totally. Uh, uh, what was the tour like for Symbolic? I mean, what was like the crowd reaction and do you have some memory from that tour? Yeah, I, it was kind of at the point where, hmm, shit, don't want to walk that way. Um, I'm just jumping off. I was doing the, I'm jumping off the bus real quick for Uh-huh. Is it too is it too loud right now for you? We're right next to a highway. I mean, it's kind of loud, but I can hear you, so it doesn't okay, matter. Well, okay, that's good. I'll I'll try to speak up. Um, <laughs> well, the 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 touring was was it was cool, but at the time, like I said, uh, people did not feel about symbolic the way that they kind of do now. You know, it was like. People were like, what the hell are you guys doing? And and Chuck just didn't care. Chuck's like, dude, I'm writing my music. I'm doing my thing. You get you you go listen to your death metal. That's yeah. That's fine, I mean, but I'm I'm moving I'm moving I'm moving ahead. I'm moving on, you know. Yeah, but that's like a great attitude to people. I mean that they should listen to their heart, you know, what other people say. I mean Absolutely. And that's one thing that Chuck definitely did, man. He was not He would not pay attention to what the trends are and jump on. Oh, obviously, you can hear in his music. He's he's doing what come is coming from him. So, you know, give the man credit for that. He was not about to jump on a trend or, you know, back in '95. That's kind of when new metal was starting to come out. You got your your corns and your, you know, I mean, look at look at Sepultura. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, like shit. You were doing your thing, and then Corn came out, and then you're doing Corn. So, <laughs> yeah. <coughs> Chuck, Chuck just never bowed to that at all. You know, he, he was oblivious to it. Yeah, and uh, I think in 1995, Chuck uh, staged a Death for Life benefit gig for to raise money for National Multiple Sclerosis Society. Can you recall that? that? Yeah, I I do. I forgot. I forgot who's somebody's mother had it in the band i think maybe it was bobby and so Actually, chuck maybe like, chuck's mother. what wasn't that mm-hmm. chuck's mother or? no i don't think so chuck's mom was always pretty pretty she was healthy uh, i mm-hmm. forgot there was somebody involved in in the family that that had it so yeah he was like let's let's raise some awareness let's do a concert for it and you know he did it was there in orlando and got a bunch of his friends bands to come and play and And I think that was, I think it came out, I think we did that show in 94, perhaps, maybe early I mean, 95, before before Symbolic came out, I think. There is a date on the website, you know, empty words, sure. so it doesn't matter. Sure, uh, yeah. And, but I it's, kind of sad, it's kind of sad, you know, because of Chuck's story, he was, uh, you know, such a humane guy, and then... I mean, karma didn't, uh, you know, do this. He, he, he was like, he, he had a bad luck, I think. Yeah, you absolutely. Know? Yeah, totally. Because, you know, uh, a lot of guys from thrash metal uh, had the cancer problem, and uh, they all survived, and Chuck was the only one who died. Yeah, sure. So it's kind of bummer. And, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I have to ask you... Uh, In 1995, you did a show with Gorgats in Montreal, Canada. Do you remember? Okay, yeah. Do you remember I, Gorgats? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we, we toured with them a couple years ago, too. And uh, have you heard their, their album, Obscura, 1998? Their album, Obscura? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember hearing that when it came out. Yeah, it's good, good stuff. I mean... Uh, did it suck like Orgats? Um, I think we were buddies with them. 
you know, and I don't know if Chuck had anything to do with like, hey, let's get Gorguts on the on the Montreal <laughs> show or anything. It might have been the local promoter said, hey, man, these guys are, you know, they're they're a draw too. Let's get them on the bill. But I, it was a great show. It was a killer show. I remember it real well. Yeah, yeah. awesome. And uh, can you recall Thrash of the Titans gig? I mean, were you there at the time? I was not. I was in. I was on tour with Strapping at the time when that was going on. So I missed that show. But that was pretty mighty. They did ask Dark Angel to to come up and play, and we we probably would have if if I was not on the road myself. Yeah, too bad. But that was a great I mean, show. And like the the cool thing was, uh, Chuck Billy made a hundred and twenty thousand. Yeah, it, he made he made a, a lot of money on that, and Chuck could have just kept the money and said, "Look, I don't have to work for a couple of years now," but he turned half of it over to Chuck Schuldiner, and he'd never even met Chuck. Wait, and uh, so he like gave Chuck sixty thousand bucks or what? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, because uh, Chuck, Chuck's bills. Were, yeah, yeah, he did. And that, you know that was a very cool thing for Chuck to do, man. He didn't have to, but he just did. So that was awesome. I mean, it's really, really bad to know that what happened next. And uh, yeah, what's like the last time you saw Chuck? Last time I saw Chuck was in '98, and I admit that our last ten days of the Symbolic tour, he had broken up the band on the Symbolic tour. He said, "This is it. I'm breaking up mm -hmm. the band after this." And our last ten days, we weren't quite seeing eye to eye, and we did not leave on the best of terms. And when I saw him in '98. Uh, we strapping had played the Dynamo Festival, and that was when when Death recorded the live at Dynamo concert. I was mm -hmm. in the crowd for that, oh. and I saw Chuck uh, for a few minutes at that 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 day. And I wasn't sure what it was going to be like. We just happened to bump into each other on the, you know, I was walking, he was walking, we bumped into each other. And it was like, hey, dude, how you doing, man? Cool, <laughs> man, I'm doing great. He's like, hey, you're working with Devin Townsend, man. That's really cool. And, you know, that, that's really cool stuff you guys are doing. And, and he was really positive. And, and, and he was like, hey, remember when we watched Devin together on, on, on the Tonight Show that one time at my house? And I'm like, yeah, man, fuck. So... <laughs> Yeah, he was. It was very cool, and and it was very cordial and very nice. And that was the last time I saw him was in '98. And when did you hear the bad news? I mean, that he died. Uh, pretty much the day it happened because um, we had. I know that um, Case from and 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 his wife from Empty Words, they had come to. Who was I playing with at the time? Probably I was with Strapping. I think we were on a Fear Factory tour, and they came to me and said, "Chuck is actually pretty, pretty bad. Would you mind, you know, just you know, in the next few hours, can you?" They came to me before sound check sort of thing, and they said, "Hey, in the next few hours, can you write maybe a little handwritten note to him and 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 stuff?" I was like, "Yeah, of course." So I wrote him a handwritten note, you know, just try to be real positive in it and try yeah. not to get too heavy or anything and at that time we weren't you know he was he was he was pretty bad but he had already beaten this one time you know i don't know if people recall that but he had some issues and then he was getting better so we were like kind of holding on to like well, well you know he's gonna pull through on this but yeah unfortunately you know a month later he was he, he was gone so too bad, too bad. yeah absolutely and uh, speaking of Chuck's legacy, uh, do you think that like death is still alive? I oh, mean, absolutely! Oh, big time! Like when we do the death to all, all tribute shows, mm -hmm. like everybody comes out to those. You know, it's it's a it's a it's a fun night, and you know, it's it's all about Chuck. You know, we just come out and play play the entire catalog. You know, we. This version of the band um, plays songs from every album, and 
and you know it's it's really enjoyable and you see you know big burly metal guys in the front row crying <laughs> you know like you see tears and smiles and awesome. and in between the songs somebody from the crowd will shout out thank you for doing this you know and then <laughs> when when you talk to the fans after the show you know half of them are like this brings back such great memories of the times I've seen death and the other half are like, we were too young to see death. So this yeah, is yeah. the closest thing we're ever going to get. And we never thought we would ever be able to see death music live played by the guys from the band. And, and so that, you know, death to all is, is a super fun, just a fun vacation of a project. So so yeah, is death it, is absolutely alive, man, fully. And uh, is it going to happen in the near future, maybe? Uh, we're work we're working on it. Absolutely, we're trying to get all our schedules together, and we're right in the uh, in the uh, sending emails out for everybody's schedules to try to. We're going to try to do something in 2018, hopefully summertime. But you know, we're just getting the schedules together now like hey i've got this time open you've got this time open i don't have this time open so we're trying to we're trying to make make stuff happen but yeah we it's it the project is alive fully uh, yeah and uh, you know in the music business when uh, some rock icon die, dies uh, he becomes a legend and his popularity skyrockets was Absolutely. that the case with uh, chuck schuldner at the time or well, although we would prefer to have Chuck with us, I, I do believe that happened. I, I, I do think so, you know, that, that his music is more vital now than, than it ever has been. And, and it's, it, it's, it is a testament to his legacy that, that you know, he's still vital. He's, his, his presence is still felt. In, in the scene and a lot of times you know a rock icon who passes they, they, they were big and they were in their their compartment of popularity and it you know like I, gosh I don't know like you know there's no grunge music anymore Kurt Cobain died there's no grunge Lucky. anymore Lucky. <laughs> but uh, I, I wouldn't say that but um, but there's there's still death metal and there's technical death metal more so than ever now and death was the leading light of it so yeah yeah chuck chuck's musical legacy is is definitely very present in a lot of the younger bands out there as well so so you know it of of great tragedy something good has come from it and that's chuck's legacy reaching out you know, and being an influence to a lot of these these super young dudes now. So that's that's great, absolutely. And uh, how big were death shows back in the nineties? Um, well, that's just it. When I joined the band, man, like people, you know, people were not, you know, people were like kind of on the fence with individual, but with symbolic a lot of the hardcores just flat out hated it so you know they wanted they wanted open casket they wanted leprosy they wanted you know evil dead and, and whatever and you know just the, 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 the yeah all the death the death metal purists just wanted it their way and since chuck was not giving it to them their, you know their way he was he was giving it to him his way oh uh, you know hey a lot of people dropped off the the concert going you know concert attendance yeah. you know because people just you know it, it was it was interesting you know it, it wasn't like we were playing you know in front of four thousand people a night you know we're playing in front of you know 800 sort of thing so i think the, sh the, the shows were well attended but um you know it, it's i just i just remember the backlash <laughs> you know <laughs> I think same uh, same thing happened to focus, uh, cynics focus. You know that the yeah, people sure. were just like, "What the fuck are these guys doing?" I mean, with all the local stuff. Uh, yeah, so sure. So they had yeah. tour with Cannibal Corpse, and you can imagine Cannibal Corpse fan listening to I mean, Oh, but, absolutely. <laughs> we were we were me and Stevie D were just talking about that tour last night, the Cynic Cannibal Corpse tour. 
<laughs> yeah, awesome. totally. I mean, uh, and uh, how close-minded metalheads can be, in your opinion? Um, they, they, they do have a tendency to do that, and that's where you just can't care about <laughs> other people's close-mindedness, you know, because like if if you're an artist, if you're a musician, you're 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 doing it for yourself first and it's just kind of a byproduct do they like it do they not like it either way i'm going to keep doing what i do um so uh, you know i think that was chuck's mindset too is like he wasn't even concerned if people liked it or not you know he was there was no you know since there was no social media you can't just see your reviews easily or or feedback. you know see the feedback like you can now and and now i i think people pay too much attention to the feedback that they get i i that's why i don't i'm not a social media person at all but but i know the importance of it but believe me i'm not sitting there reading reviews you know reading forums of you know what i'm up to personally i I don't care. I, I do what I do because I love doing it and nobody's ever going to tell me, you know, you suck and I'm going to go, oh man, I suck. <laughs> People tell me I suck all the time, I'm sure, but I, I never read it. So. Yeah, right. And uh, how important was the Fresh of the Titans tour for the whole genre, you know? Thrash of the Titans. Um, I mean, the which came together, I mean, uh, Exodus, uh, Legacy, the whole band. Oh, okay. Oh, that one, the, the, that concert. Yeah, oh, gosh, I wasn't there, you know, so I, I'm sure it was a very, very important thing. Um, that was the Chuck Tribute thing you're talking about, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, I think I think it was a great concert and all, um, you know, I, it, it had a lot of bands come out and come out of the woodwork and stuff, and Yeah, maybe that that helped re-spark some thrash. But when did that happen? 2001, I think? One, yes. Uh, I think it yeah. was August 9th or something. All right, yeah, there Or you 11th. go. Yeah, yeah, well, you didn't see a real huge uh, resurgence of thrash metal right after that or anything, you know? I mean, because, like, but I suppose it, you know, maybe maybe it had something, something good, you know? Gosh, I don't know. <laughs> And do you think that thrash metal is dead right now? I mean, no, I God, didn't... Jesus, no. Thrash metal is as big as ever. You know, like it's 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 crazy. You know, it, it's but you know everything is cyclical. Like I when when I was stepping away from Dark Angel, I remember telling the guys, "Hey, man, in five or ten years, this is going to come right back around and it's going to be popular again. So why don't we talk about getting it back together in ten years, guys?" And <laughs> Oh. You know, it's sure enough. I mean, it's like it's really easy to see that if you go away for a few years, there will be some hunger from, you know, there will be some positive response if you decide to come back and do some stuff. You know, if, you, yeah. if your band was well known. So, um, yeah, yeah, you know, I, thrash is is as big as ever now. You know, you've got like for instance. This package right here, Testament, Annihilator, Death, Death Angel. Angel. We're on tour My together. God. Like this is this is a sellout package every night. We're playing 1,500 seaters and selling them out. You know, thousand yeah. seaters selling them out. So, <laughs> you know, so thrash is thrash is is back. You know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, too bad because I I really wanted to see that show in Budapest, and I had the money for the ticket and blah blah, and uh, I wanted to buy. It. The ticket in September and it was sold out and I I was like man how did that happen yeah yeah man boo <laughs> and uh, can you tell me something about your uh, latest uh, projects what's going around for you in the future yeah sure well for instance what have we got going on there's um well you I I don't know how familiar Europe is with with one of my bands called Death Clock yeah yeah of course um. We, uh, yeah, Metalocalypse. Well, the 
for the, the, the powers that be have created a situation to where Death Clock can no longer exist. But Brendan Small, the creator and leader of Death Clock, he's he's still got a lot of music in him. So um, we have a new like we have a very Death Clock sounding band together called Galacticon 2 and the latest album is called uh, Become the Storm and sound you know it's it's very influenced by Death Clock definitely there's a, you know there's no doubt it sounds a lot like Death Clock but uh, um, you know we've got that and you know Zimmer's Hole is another project I'm involved in and that's that's um, that's doing its thing and I do a lot of clinics and we have the Death to All thing that we're trying to to get going and dark angel is going to have a few shows over you know in, in 2018 it's looking like and testament will continue to to do their thing absolutely and and i i you know the my project that i'm most excited about is a project that i have with my guitarist lara christine and that's our project that's like we're writing songs from the ground up and that's my most savage project at the moment we don't have a name for it yet but uh you know we're writing songs like crazy and and that you know she's a destroying guitarist so um you know she's a riff writing maniac as well so that's that's working out pretty good and um yeah man so i've this is what i do you know i just i i play metal for a living i play music so um in a i i write personally right now i've got a a collection of artwork that is coming out it's uh through a company called scene four and it's a uh it's 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 drumming artwork it's uh it's like um they gave they put me in a dark room on a drum kit with lit drumsticks and oh, awesome, man. Oh. And, and they just you know they let the the exposures on the cameras just you know create these just crazy looking uh vid, you know these these visual like awesome. just <laughs> awesomeness and and I think that's available at genehoaglandart.com. It's just coming out right at the moment. It's just had its release like like this week sort of thing. So, you know, if people are interested in that, they could check that out. And in January, I'm going to be filming a documentary for 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 an for an English network, um, a, a a documentary on on drummers, and they've got a lot of heavy hitters on this one. You know, a lot of a lot of huge drummers, you know. So I know I'm a, I'm a part of that. So that, that's going to be pretty good. Awesome. And so just just staying super busy, I tell you. <laughs> and what about autobiography, maybe, or a Dark Angel documentary, or something something like that? Hey, you never know. You know, people always tell me, dude, you should write a you should write an autobiography. <laughs> God, I yeah, yeah. fill up fill, fill up about two books. If I, I were to it. ever write a documentary, though. If I were to ever write a, an autobiography, I tell you one thing: I would not do. I would not write about my childhood all that much, even though I had an. Even though, like, I, I might write a little bit about my teenage years, but um, because I had a teenage life, unlike most, you know, like I, I was going to clubs when I was twelve and thirteen, and you know, hanging around with all the LA club bands that became huge, you know. There you go. And, you know, like I said, I was working for Slayer when I was 15. So, um, so all that stuff going on. But, uh, um, I, yeah, I wouldn't write about my childhood because I always find that to be the most boring parts of everybody's autobiographies. <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't need to know about when you were seven and your grandma bought you your first guitar. Like, get right to the sex, drugs, and rock and roll, damn it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Awesome. And uh, what about the new Dark Angel record? I mean, well, we are in the process of writing it. You know, my, my schedule is, is, is pretty crazy. So trying to devote as much time as I would love to, to to writing it has been a challenge. But, you know, we're, we're in the process of writing it. And, uh, you know, that, that that's pretty good. And there's no timeline to when it's going to be completed. And I appreciate everybody's patience, you know, because I... I 
you know, I can only imagine people like, hey, man, where's that new Dark Angel you promised a couple <laughs> years back? But yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're, tr we're trying to work on it, but I appreciate everybody's patience, but I'm going to make it a fucking the most ball-crushing record possible. Totally. <laughs> and what's the lineup for Dark Angel? That would be the Leave Scars lineup, which is oh. Ron Reinhardt on vocals and Eric Meyer and Jim Durkin, both on guitars, and Mike Gonzalez on bass. So it's the Leave Scars lineup, which is a great lineup, man. We, we just we had a great time. So when we get together and do shows, we, we have a, a cool time doing it. Man. We're, you know, we, this is this is my family, too. You know? we're, all, we're all brothers. So <laughs> it's, it's pretty cool to get back together and have a good family family reunion and play some metal. Kick ass. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Uh, any, uh, do you have something exclusive for this interview, maybe? Um, gosh, let me see. Anything exclusive? Well, just you know, want everybody to have a good, good holiday season because I know we're getting close to that. But boy, I've given you pretty much all the info. You know, yeah, like, yeah. this project and that and that and this and that. But uh, hey, man, just thank you for your time and I uh, appreciate the platform. And you know, it was good chatting with you. And I'm, you know, I, I, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing anybody out on the road and you know, come up and say hey and. And definitely come check out. I'm, I'm always on tour, so I'll see, I'll see all you guys out on the road real soon. Absolutely. Yeah, kick ass. I just want to say that uh, I'll be doing an interview with Andy LaRock in, on Monday, three days. Nice. In three days, you know. So, deaf fans, check it out. Cool, man. Yeah, definitely. Please tell Andy hello from me. He's a very nice yeah. guy. I got, like yeah. I said, I got to meet him in 2013 for the first time. That was <laughs> hilarious. Yeah. yeah awesome. Yeah, he, Man, he's great, totally. Thank you so much for this interview. And All I right, Milo, sure, yeah, well, thank you. See you in Serbia. Uh, <laughs> yeah, man, I appreciate your time, brother. Thank you very much, and we'll be back to Serbia, I'm sure, man, no doubt. Yeah, yeah, so goodbye, man. Thanks. All right, brother, take care, man, thank you. Thanks.